Thank you. I probably won't get one of those after I'm done, so that's great. Um, my name is Josh Lozman. I'm a Deputy Director of Global Policy and Advocacy for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I am just a quick interlude to quiet everyone down, so we'll get off stage quickly. But we are one of the uh, sponsors of the Spotlight Health Festival uh, this year. We're very excited to be doing that. I'm also incredibly excited to be introducing this session because the Aspen New Voices Fellowship Program that we'll see tonight is one of the programs that we support and are just so excited about the progress we've seen, the partnership that we have with several of the fellows organizations separate from the program, and some of the work that our principals, uh, some of them I've gotten to work with, um, and we do this on such a regular basis that we get to see the development of the fellows through the program, and that's just, there's nothing more exciting to watch than that. So. Uh, incredibly grateful to the fellows, to Andrew, uh, the director of the program, the new director, who has come to take on and take the program to the next level. So I want to thank Aspen for the invitation to be a sponsor of this, which we're happy to do. Um, congratulate them on what I've seen so far to be a hugely successful conference. And most importantly tonight, to uh, congratulate the fellows on all the work they've done. So I will stop there, but I'll, I have one last job, and that is an equally fun one. So um, Barbara Bush and I were just uh, talking. We met about five years ago when the Global Health Corps was just uh, basically an idea at that point trying to get off the ground. And I was working for an organization called The One Campaign. And we had all these uh, ideas that we were brainstorming with quite a group of people in the room. And what we we're just saying was when we look back five years ago to all those ideas, so many of them have happened. And it's been in large part because of her leadership. So to look back and see that, um, I'm both excited uh, by what's happened as part, uh, representative of the Gates Foundation. I'm excited to say we're now supporting the Global Health Corps, both for its work, but uh, importantly for the fellows program, the alumni program, to keep those fellows linked and to keep their work going, which is just an incredible part of the program. So I welcome Barbara Bush up to the stage to introduce the program. Thank you, um, and I am so excited to welcome everyone here. As Josh said, I work with an organization called Global Health Corps, and what we do is bring new talent to the field of global health. And we work with amazing young leaders who every day we need to remind to them that as leaders, they need to bring their voices to the issues that they care about, which is why I love the Aspen New Voices Fellowship, because it's specifically ensuring that we have diverse thinkers raising their voices to affect social change. So tonight, I am really excited that we will all have the opportunity to listen to 10 great stories and meet the 10 great innovators who will bring them to life for us. As we all know, storytelling is a powerful tool. Um, and any great storyteller is really a great teacher, which is something that I knew growing up. Uh, I had a mother who was both a teacher and a librarian. And as you can imagine, sometimes the fun seemed like it would never stop with a mother who was a librarian. <laughs> but my mother knew the powers that stories had to open the world to my sister and me. And sneakily, I think my mother also realized that stories could open our world to her. Um, every day when we got home from school, instead of my mother saying, how was your day? She would say, tell me a story. And we would just talk away. And that's the way that we learn to communicate um, in our family. And now that I work in the field of global health, my world is dominated by numbers. Um, we look at databases and spreadsheets, and we read percentages of stockouts. And I think the biggest lesson that I've seen in global health is that for us, numbers don't inspire people to act. Stories do. And if you work in global health, you have to remember every single day that statistics aren't just a random number. They are actually representing the people and the families that we are trying to serve and those people's stories who desperately want to be heard. And so with that, um, I am really excited to turn the microphone over to two people that have been enormous supporters of um, the Aspen New Voices Fellowship. That is John and Courtney. Um, and I know that tonight, many of us will never have the opportunity to visit Jacques Sebisaho in Congo or Joan Otai in Kenya, but at least by getting to listen to their stories, we can bear witness to the enormous courage that they have brought to their work and glimpse into the little bitty moments that they get to witness every single day. 
Um, so I wanted to turn it over to John and Courtney, but I wanted to end with a quote that I read this week. Um, as Courtney and I were coordinating for this week, it's actually the quote that is in her e-signature. Um, and I think it is a perfect quote for tonight. And that is, engrave this upon your heart. There isn't anyone you couldn't love once you heard their story. Good evening, everyone. It's fantastic to see so many people here to share in these stories that our Aspen New Voices are about to bring to this stage. Um, Courtney and I are partners in life and in work. Uh, my name is John Carey, and this is Courtney Martin. Um, we work with the Aspen Institute, as well as with TED and several other entities to help people tell their stories. And it's amazing work. The best part about it is, in fact, sitting right where you are to watch people share their lives. And they've got the most incredible tales to tell. Um, when Courtney and I were reflecting back on the year that we had previously, toward the end of, of 2013, both of us, without reservation, said meeting the New Voices Fellows in Johannesburg for their training was the most amazing thing. These are extraordinary individuals. Um, they all have very unique very humanizing stories, and um, we are just so delighted to be able to share them with you today. Um, so here's a little bit about the structure of the event. Uh, we wanted to keep it fast, surprising, um, something that would be a real fresh shift from the kind of panel experience that you've been having today. So this is going to be very unlike anything else that happened today. Um, we're going to have three-minute stories, three minutes, and each scholar is or each fellow is answering the question, why do you do what you do through a story, right? Why do you do what you do through a story? And importantly, one image, okay? So you're going to see one image up here, and you're going to hear one three-minute story. Um, what I really want to emphasize is that all of these fellows, and you're actually not hearing from all of the New Voices fellows, there are even more, if you can believe it, um, all of them are policy experts, essentially. I mean, they could stand up here and, and do the data thing and do the policy thing and give you a systemic analysis. And, and all of them are, are deep experts in their fields. So if any of you are um, media who are looking for experts, if any of you are funders who are looking for really amazing organizations, all of them have them. Tonight, you're not going to hear that side of them for a very specific reason, because we wanted to bring that story element. So I just want to say that very clearly, because there's a lot more where this came from. Tonight, you're only going to get these three-minute, very personal stories. Um, and I want you to just be there with them, right? Um, They're often sharing really vulnerable things. And the best thing you can do as an audience is receive that gift and return it with your warmth, with your attention. Um, that means turning off your cell phones. It means actually, you know, being present, being present here and, and receiving the gift that, that you're about to receive, which I, I feel as John said, is one of the biggest gifts of the past couple years of my life has been working with this crew of people um, who are just warm and kind and making true um, paradigm shifting change in the world. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome our first speaker, um, Dr. Yet Demesi. She's the country director from Engender Health, and she loves home-cooked meals but hates cooking. <laughs> I'll see if you can help Thank you, Kosni. Salam, shalom. It was back in 1989, after five years of going through intensive medical education at the Addis Ababa University Medical Faculty, that I became one of the few medical interns. Wearing my gown and hanging my stethoscope around my neck like most senior doctors do, I felt so proud of myself. I felt so enthusiastic. And it seems as if my addition to the pool of medical doctors would change the landscape of health and disease. <laughs> and uh, when I was first assigned as an intern to the gynecological ward, I made this first round with the senior gynecologist and the residents, and we went to the room labeled septic abortion. 
As we entered the room, I saw rows of beds, eight to 10 on each side, and on each side was a girl fighting for her life. A girl that had, that had undergone through, through back street uh, abortion and arriving at the hospital losing so much blood and having serious infections. The fragile bodies of these girls lying on the beds, IV fluids attached to their arms, oxygen masks covering their nose and mouth, each one gasping and fighting for her life, and parents and relatives in the back frantically crying and chanting prayers. This tragic, this tragic situation changed me deeply at my core. For the first time in my life, I felt guilty. I felt guilty because of the sheltered life I had enjoyed. And I was oblivious to the untold sufferings my, my community, my uh, peers were undergoing. And I felt angry at the same time because this was a preventable situation because I came to realize that what is driving this is the underlying injustices and vulnerabilities that these women have to go through in their lives. When I was born, it was such a joyful occasion in my family. But for many girls, birds heralds the beginning of discrimination because girls are considered as less worthy and are unfairly discriminated than boys. When I was six years of age, I was already in grade one, having lots of fun playing high jump with my friends, while girls at that age in the rural communities in the, in, in the urban slums are burdened with taking care of other siblings. And when I was age 15, I was already deep into my studies and in high school, while girls, many girls in my own community are forced to drop out of school and to get married to a man they have never seen before. And their first sexual experience is a coerced experience. And these girls have to travel several kilometers barefoot to fetch firewood and to collect water for the household. And they work from dawn to dusk. And when I was 23 years old, I was already an intern and looking forward to embrace good life. While girls, as I told you, are already in the end of their life journey. Too young to die and the loss of so much talent and goodwill. I chose to marry my husband and went to marry him. I chose when to get pregnant and decided the number of children I wanted to have. I chose and decided the type of contraceptives I wanted to use. And I strongly believe that these choices, these life critical decisions should be made available to all girls and women, regardless of where they live. And that is why I work in women's cells and that is why I'm committed to represent the voices of those girls in the gynecological ward. And I am committed to do so until the time when sexual and reproductive health quality services are available to each girl and to each woman and their rights is protected, respected and fulfilled. I thank you.
Congratulations. Wow, thank you so much. Our next fellow is UT Effion, Dr. UT Effion. He's a research associate with the University of Michigan School of Public Health. You can see him wearing Michigan apparel every single minute of the day. <laughs> right now, it's closest to his ankles. He's sporting some Michigan socks. Most other times, it's more at eye level. Speaking of eye level, UT says, I blink three times whenever I feel a sense of danger and I strongly believe that it keeps me and my family safe. UT. I remember this as if it was just yesterday. I had walked about a mile to fetch drinking water and at the tap, Chukudi, an older neighbor, asked me what I was going to be when I grew up. Without thinking, I said I was going to be a medical doctor. And even though I was just 10 years of age and a kid from a poor neighborhood, that dream was real to me. Because my dad had taught me to believe in myself. And I believed that I could conquer any obstacle to my dream to make the world a better place. But nine years later, as I traveled 12 hours on a bus, from Lagos to Calabar. Within weeks, I became ill. My dream literally died as soon as it became real. Crunching headaches, burning fevers, but yet, I went to class. At any cost, I wanted to be in medical school. But I died. I lapsed into a coma, and I remained unresponsive for two weeks, when I came back to life, I had lost my hearing to complications of meningitis. Meningitis is common in northern Nigeria. And this is because northern Nigeria lies in a climate zone known as the meningitic belt. This climate zone extends from the shores of Senegal in the west to the hills of Ethiopia in the east running across the northern aspects of West Africa. And in this region, every year, thousands of young adults and children get ill with meningitis. 10% of them die, no matter what you do. I was one of the few that survived. And for that age, I was lucky. I had never been to the north of my country. But when I traveled between Lagos and Calabar, which were both in the south, it was a time of unusual heat. The climate had changed. And I wonder, was climate change widening the belt? And it extended to the south of our country. And was that why I got meningitis? Was I vaccinated? Was that vaccine of any good? Now, I dream. I dream again of doing things to stop this from happening. Because I returned to medical school, I became a physician. I am now a, research, a researcher in public health. But the reality still goes on. And this year, as we speak, Nigeria is battling the worst outbreak of meningitis in recent years. This year alone, there have been 17,000 cases with nearly 1,000 deaths. But like I said, I dream. I now work at the global intersection of, global, of environmental health and infectious diseases because I've always wondered what is the connection between climate change and human health. And my work is now very fulfilling, and so I dream. I dream of a day when tapping our resources does not put any danger to human health. I dream of a day when everybody has access to universal primary health care. But in my country, poverty, lack of education, lack of political will, and religious extremism by groups such as Boko Haram, have impeded the delivery of good health care. But I still dream. And I know that as we work together, this dream will come true. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have 
Dr. Anik Suplis Dupuy, the executive director of PSI Haiti. And I love this. She says, I like to sing in the shower, but make up songs with the statistics that I have to remember before making a presentation or speech. <laughs> Thankfully, she was just belting out whatever song she wanted for this, because there are no statistics involved. Anik. I always knew I wanted to change the world. I knew I wanted to change Haiti, my country. I knew I wanted to have an impact on Haiti. And here I was doing it every single day in and out. I was working with youth. I was working with women in reproductive health, in HIV AIDS prevention, and family planning. I was going all over around the country, talking to them, reaching them, providing services and activities that would actually change their lives and have an impact and help them change their behaviors. The more I started working, the more I had responsibilities. I started to become frustrated. Frustrated because with responsibilities, I started to understand the bureaucracy around our work. I started to understand the donors and their priorities, and priorities that did not always meet the priorities of the people. I started to see programs that had a huge impact on the population, and these programs closing and not being able to continue because of lack of funding. And worst of all, I started to see my people, the one we wanted to help, sitting around and waiting for NGOs, waiting for the international community to come and help them. I was mad. My optimism was diminishing. I was actually beginning to ask myself, is this a life that I want to have? Do I want to continue doing this work? Is it worth it? Then, on January 12, 2010, the unbelievable happened in my country. I was at home with my husband and my children, and the ground started to shake beneath us. We had no idea what was going on. We, had n we were not prepared for this. We had not talked about that. I was scared. We were, it was unbelievable. The four of us were fine, but what about my friends? What about my family? What about my city? What was going on? At that time, all we could hear were the screams. All we could see was the smoke coming from the city. I felt powerless. Here I was wanting to change my country, and I couldn't do anything. My government was on the floor. I felt I was shaken to my core. The next morning at sunrise, we woke up to go see what was going on, to go find my family, to go see the city. As I drove, I was speechless. There were no words to describe what I was seeing. The city was destroyed. There was so much fear, so much pain, so much suffering. We had no idea how we would stand up, rise, and be able to continue as a country. Then, in the middle of all of this, I saw something unbelievable, something unexpected. I started to see courage in people's eyes. I saw a man pick up rocks from, from a rubble to be able to clear a house where a stranger was in there stranded. I saw a baker open up his store to give bread to people that had been there all night long. I started to see health professionals leave their families and their own personal problems to be able to be there to help others. I saw Haitians wanting to be there for each other and being a solution instead of having to wait for the international community or for NGOs to come do the work. I saw that light in their eyes. I saw that possibility, that glimpse of a possibility that together we could come as one to be able to help each other. In the middle of the chaos, I was asked if I didn't want to take my children and myself and just leave leave the chaos, leave the country, leave the disaster, because there was no way that this could get better. There was no way that Haiti could stand up again. And my answer was no. It was no because I saw that light in their eyes, that light that showed me that we as a people can come together and make this country better. Thank you. Thank you, Anique. <clears throat> our next fellow and our next speaker is Mary Juanica Sando, Dr. Mary Sando. 
She's a health specialist with UNICEF. And if you're impressed by that, you'll be even more impressed to know that she loves to sing and she can do a mean imitation of Celine Dion. <laughs> Mary. Two of my happiest day in my life were in 2009 and 2010, when I gave birth to my two children at a consultancy hospital in Dar es Salaam. But as much as I felt the joy and the dignity of having survived two safe deliveries, I could not forget that five years earlier, I was not the woman on the stretcher but the woman in a white coat, trying to save the life of a woman on a stretcher. But I failed. We all failed. Anna was brought into the labor room while I was working into, as an intern in that hospital. She was in a very weak state. Her eyes were barely open. She was very pale. Her gown was stained with blood. So my team and I quickly gathered around her, taking her vitals and blood, for we knew she needed emergency blood transfusion. But in the span of like 30 minutes, Anna became, began having difficulty in breathing. We did everything we could to save her, but all our efforts were in vain. I recall pausing, looking at Anna, lying on a pool of blood, and I felt very devastated from us not being able to save her. She was only 26 years old. And even though I didn't know her, I knew she must have had a whole life ahead of her. So how could she have just died like that? So later on, I gathered courage and got out of the labor room to meet her husband. And I still recall that very painful moment of having had to inform him of the unfortunate passing of his wife of just one year. It was so difficult because their baby girl died just a few hours earlier in childbirth. So later on, as I gathered the medical records to certify Anna's death, I realized that she was anemic from the time she was pregnant in the beginning to the end. And her anemia made it very difficult for her to survive following the severe bleeding she suffered after her birth, after the birth of her child. And so, despite all our efforts, Anna became one among many Tanzanian women who suffer due to the severe bleeding after, after birth that most succumb. Seeing Anna and so many women after that die because of maternal complications was and continues to be very heartbreaking. And so even today, 24 women die each day in my country because of maternal complications. And we know now that more than 90% of these deaths can be prevented using very simple interventions, such as ensuring women attend antenatal clinic early and that any pregnancy danger signs are timely identified and managed, but also using simple medication, such as injecting women with pitocin immediately after delivery to prevent them from the possibility of bleeding like Anna's suffering but also using simple medications again, like magnesium sulfate, that would be able to prevent and manage women who may get complications following high blood pressure induced by their pregnancy, controlling infections after birth, and also improving emergency obstetric care. So we know these interventions work. They have been proven to work. So as a doctor and a mother myself, I chose to make the difference, because it was the lives of all these women and the death of one that inspired me to do my work. Today, Anna would have been 10 years older, and her daughter would have been 10 years. So I do my work for them. Thank you.
That one really hits me. Um, I gave birth seven months ago, and I was severely anemic throughout my pregnancy, so it just feels so recent, so relevant, and Mary's work so important. Thank you, Mary. Uh, next up, we have a bit of a shift. Um, this, this fella is a doctor, but not like the other doctors you've just heard. This is Dr. Mishkin Ingawale. He's the co-founder of Biosense Technologies. Um, and he is just a fount of ideas. He actually came up to me like a couple of minutes before we started. He was like, I've got an idea. And I thought, uh-oh, this has to do with this presentation and we're about to go on and uh, this is not good to change at the last minute. And he said, I'm thinking we should build an app where we count fish for coral reefs and it could be a collaboration between me and this other fellow. And I was like, this is Mishkin. He's just constantly has these incredible ideas. So you are so lucky to hear from this absolutely energetic, infectious human being. Um, his interesting fact, with, which I just love, is he was named after a character in a Dostoevsky novel. And he's very glad nobody in primary school was into Russian literature. <laughs> so here's Mishkin. So Mishkin is the idiot in Dostoevsky's novel. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm, uh, I'm one of those guys who just loves technology. Uh, you know, the latest gadget. I just can't help myself. I have to look at it, how it works, how it's, you know, I'm one of those guys. Um, so in 2000, I mean, in general, you know, these, these kind of people, and like me, I used to treat marketing and marketing people, marketeers, as the incarnation of evil. I, 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 that was my picture. Technology will save the world, vaccines, healthcare, big inventions, big ideas. Uh, so in 2006, I was really happy to get a chance to work for Nokia in India. Uh, that was like a big thing for me and Nokia was really big in India at the time. Seven out of every 10 phones was a Nokia phone. Uh, so all pumped up, first day of work I turned up uh, with like hundreds of ideas buzzing. We can do this, you know, the phone can have this, we can change this and this button here and we can have this and that and this and that. And I just sort of poured it all out to my uh, boss who listened patiently. And uh, sort of, yeah, yeah, okay. So the <laughs> then he said, Mishkin, understand that the mobile phone business is not about mobile phones. Yeah, and he explained to me how it worked. You know, I, I didn't quite get it. I was this young kid full of, you know, this optimism about technology and all that. Uh, slowly, I started to understand, but it really hit home to me once. Uh, I was in a shopping mall in South Delhi, in uh, negotiating a contract with a, a distributor. So, uh, I, it went well, I, I went out of his office, and I was walking through the mall. Uh, it, it was a nice big mall, very posh. It had, you, I could see different brands, I could see big hoardings, I could see people uh, walking past, getting into the shops, glass, you know, it, it, was, uh, it was wonderful. And suddenly, I started getting it. I, I, everything sort of moved in slow motion. It was as if a scene from the Matrix. I could see how it worked. I could see that it was not about technology, it was not about the phones and the washing machines. It was not about any of that at all. I could see like, you know, parents and their kids run, the kids were running around, entering shops and parents were looking in and they could see what was happening and I could see their li eyes light up and I suddenly realized that they were not buying this thingies in the box. They were buying a new life. They were buying an idea, a hope that, that their life would be better, different. That's what marketing had done to them. And I, and I suddenly realized in all, this is not really a bad thing. In India, this was changing the face of India. Uh, so, uh, I, I walked out of the mall, I still love technology, but something small had changed inside of me. I started thinking, what if we could use capitalism, what if we could use this idea, this hope, this marketing, and apply it to other stuff, you know, medical stuff, sanitation, water, uh, energy. What if, you know, what if we could do that? So, uh, a few years later, I happened to be working with a team of doctors, uh, and uh, we had a big idea, big technology idea, that uh, we could use mobile phones, Android-powered devices, uh, to take healthcare to places where otherwise healthcare did not exist. So we eventually ended up building a platform on Android, which, with a, with a small peripheral, could do imaging for urine and blood test, uh, blood strips. Basically, it could diagnose diabetes and 25 other complications, 
at less than 10 cents per test. So, I mean, that, 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 that's what uh, we were super, you know, we formed a company called Biosense. We, we sort of uh, uh, took it uh, to use. Other. My, my doctor friends were all like, yes, yes, Mishkin, let's raise a bunch of funding and, you know, let's try to sell it. Suddenly, I, I realized back to the mall scene. We are not going to push this technology to people. Let's, let's build it together. So we, we essentially allowed local entrepreneurs. We worked with local entrepreneurs. We lo worked with users. They changed the product for us. We would have otherwise you know, walked off a cliff. It was a bad, there were a few design issues. We didn't have. <laughs> so it, I, I realized that it was not about the technology. It was not about our big idea, save the world idea. It was more about being a small part of this big user story. Um, so now, and now these days, uh, I you know this, after this matrix scene and sort of life-changing thingy, I get a lot of uh, young. I, I have, as a non-profit with which I'm working, I get young entrepreneurs with big ideas. You know, they come to me and say, "Mishkin, Mishkin, Mishkin, they've got this fantastic thingy, thingy which we have built, and it's going to save the world." I just need one million dollars to prove it. <laughs> so that's where I put on my best Keanu Reeves face and I say, "No, that's not how it works. Let me show you." Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Kiana. <laughs> Wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Our next fellow and speaker is an amazing person, Dr. Jacques Sabiso. He is the founder of, co-founder of Amani Global Works. He's the proud parent of four children, and he's also a choral director. But Jacques also made a lasting mark in my heart when from literally the other side of the world, he recited almost verbatim an article that Courtney and I had written focused on dignifying design. And since that time, every time we interact, Jacques and I talk about the word dignity and what it means to us. And so it's with no greater pleasure than right now that I get to introduce my very special friend, Jacques. When we hear about Rwanda and Congo in the news, it's all about genocide, women being raped, wars. And what about this tiny island where I am from, of 250,000 people, that is building an innovative healthcare system and driven by forgotten marginalized people we call pygmies, the native. Nine years ago, my wife, a nurse, and I couldn't stand by while many people were dying from preventable diseases. We couldn't stand by while girls were, have been mar married just to be taken away from the families, families and given to men so that they could be fed. We couldn't stand by. We couldn't just sit in New York and enjoy a good life we decided to go back. And the best way we thought to change and, and, and bring our, uh, our contribution to this community was by building ecologies, ecotourism. We believe that by building that will provide many jobs to people. We believe that if people had jobs, they will be, they will, they will be able to take care of the families. A few years later, while exploring possibilities, and the geographic space where to build those ec ecologies, we stumbled in a native, the Pygmy's village. We just learned that two children have died. And I asked why they died. Sikujua, the oldest of, uh, of women who, by the way, told me that she was invited in 1961 at my mom's wedding, told me, what do you mean? No one will look at us. No one will touch us. I couldn't believe that in 20th century, pygmies were still marginalized, still did, did still exist in the eyes of other people. In fact, pygmies believe they're not humans. And other members of the community believe pygmies are not humans. They're not seen, they're not heard. Then I asked what they thought about this ecology business. 
One, the elders said, we love the idea, but what if you built a dispensary for us where we could be, we would be treated like other human beings, like human beings? I was shocked. It became clear to me that it's not what I want. It's not what I thought was good for them. It's what they believe is good for them. They made it clear. The weaker, the powerless be me. I spoke with the communities and we made clear that they were the only people who would have to build their infrastructure. Although they didn't have money, we, we decided that they had to use whatever they had. So with sticks and mud, they built their first clinic. And for the first time, the, those who consider themselves humans and non-humans worked together to build the first clinic. Few years later, after we succeeded, we decreased the cholera rate to zero, the community felt the need to build, to expand the clinic. I believe in a dignifying design. I believe that if we build in the community a beautiful building that inspires the community, that gives them hope and believe in themselves. But we didn't have much land because a powerful landowner around was uh, planted sugarcane. And as some of us know, sugarcane plantation can be a prime bride for mosquito that transmit malaria. So m people who are being uh, treated at the hospital will leave at the, uh, the hospital suffering from malaria. We did everything we could, but the authorities could not take the sugar plantation away. We tried to shut down the clinic until we solved the problem. Then one morning, I was waken up by a group of native the pygmies who just said, we just finished the job and the clinic is safe. They are not seen, they are not heard, they, are not, they can't be arrested because they don't exist. They don't pay taxes. So these powerless people who have been looked down, they brought this beautiful idea of building a clinic and they're the one who saved the clinic. I'm happy to announce that in August, we'll open a beautiful 50-bed hospital with solar power, running water, internet connection on one kilometer radius. <laughs> it is this determination, this courage, this belief that they also deserve being part of the community that wakes me up every morning and go work with them. And that's why I do what I do. Thank you. You can see why we're moved by that man, huh? Um, all right, our next speaker is a very gentle soul um, I've had the pleasure of working with him on his writing over the last year, and I've just been repeatedly touched by how gentle and insightful he is. Um, he also likes to share really gross-out medical stories with me that freak me out, but most of the time he's very gentle. Um, he's Dr. Kaz Bilcha, and he's the clinical director of Gondar University Hospital, and his interesting fact, you can tell by now we asked all of the, the fellows for one interesting fact, broke my heart. It was that he loves walking in the rain. So here he is. So, do you know this? We humans are in a battle with lies. So here is the story. Recently, I was called in a medical mission in one of the oldest churches of Ethiopia, 100 miles away, where there is a holy school that uh, accommodates priests, deacons, and church scholars. The church was also home for the poor and destitute. So people there, they seldom change clothes, and they are commonly infested by body lice. So when my medical team arrived there, we were able to recognize what was going on. Many people were sick, and they were along the church corridors and under the trees. It was not a rare epidemic. It was an epidemic of Laos-born relapsing fever. 
So it is a cause of thousands of deaths in Ethiopia every year. Even locals knew it. One of the priests told us, this is all the result of body lice infestations. We just prey on body lice. We try to kill them manually on daily basis. We spray holy water on them, but they continue killing us. How could this small creature, having a brain size of thousands of times less, could cause this much trouble? Should be a question that beset mankind. So this tiny blood-sucking hitchhikers <laughs> lived with humans for millennia. In spite of all attempts humans made to get rid of them. They went along the ride when humans conquered the globe. They move and they change and they migrate with humans. When humans evolve and lose their fur and start to wear clothes an evolutionary means of preventing lice infestations, lice also lost their wings. They flattened and they changed their color to adapt their new mammalian environment. Actually, lice change faster and they tend to outsmart humans in adapting their only host. So this long human-lice interaction actually interwins with the germ they carry, the bacteria they could transmit. Lice infestation is actually nothing compared with the bacteria they could transmit. Lice, of course, could cause itching and annoyance, but the germ they carry could cause death with an epidemic scale. That was what exactly happened in the church, an epidemic of Laos-born relapsing fever. So once a cause of multiple outbreaks in Western Hemisphere, especially during World Wars, Laos-born relapsing fever is, is not known in any part of the world except in the highlands of Ethiopia and in parts of Sudan. So with increasing migration, movement of people, increasing wealth inequity, it's likely that Laos-born relapsing fever could re-emerge to the world. It will be the next emerging infectious disease because lies are everywhere. And the changing, the warming globe is becoming more conducive to arthropods, including lice, but not for humans, as you know. So we should beat lice harder than ever. Otherwise, they will continue killing us. Thank you. Thanks so much. That man's smile and gleaming teeth juxtaposed with that <laughs> has got to be one of the oddest sights you'll see today. Thank you. So our next fellow and speaker is Ola, Dr. Ola. She is the managing director of Flying Doctors Nigeria. When we first met a couple of years ago, she tried convincing me that lots of doctors are also helicopter pilots. <laughs> I didn't think so. As you might be able to notice when she steps up on stage, and she's much taller than uh, I would ever be comfortable walking on, safe walking on, Ola reports that she loves shopping. <laughs> Ola. Thank you, John. Meet Mr. Mustafa. He's 70 years old. He's the CEO of a multinational company, and he's also a billionaire. Now meet his girlfriend, Candice. She's 22 years old. She's broke as hell. And uh, she's been dating Mr. Mustafa for the past six months. Mr. Mustafa, as you may have all guessed, is Candice's sugar daddy. And the basis of their sugar daddy relationship is Mr. Mustafa takes responsibility for giving Candice various favors and money and gifts 
in exchange for, well, whatever, Mr. Mustafa wants. You see, Mr. Mustafa dictates what Candice is getting, and, she dict and he dictates what he wants, and Candice simply obeys. Now, the weirdest thing, I think, about their relationship is that Mr. Mustafa has a lot of experience in business and economics and markets and could very, very easily empower Candice to be a business person just like him. But instead, he keeps Candice on a sort of leash, giving her just enough to keep her happy, but never enough to prevent her from running back to him. I believe that there's a similar dynamic between the West and Africa. Every year, there are policies and clinical protocols and best practices cop almost copied and pasted directly and awkwardly into Africa. They're often far too expensive, which makes them unsustainable and inappropriate. And there's very, very little thought given to the concept of reverse innovation. This is the ability of African entrepreneurs ourselves to develop solutions that are not only going to solve our healthcare problems, but healthcare problems across the globe. In lots of parts of Africa, we transact in shops and rural marketplaces using our mobile phone. So we have mobile wallets, and I can go up to a person selling meat or veg or rice in the rural market in the middle of nowhere and pay her with my mobile phone. Here in Aspen, I can't even buy a Louis Vuitton handbag with mobile money. That means that in this small area of mobile technology, we've actually managed to leapfrog over the West and start using technology that has not been adapted here before. And I believe that if we can succeed in leapfrogging in this single area of mobile technology, then we can leapfrog in healthcare as well. I am the founder and CEO of West Africa's first indigenous air ambulance service. Every single year, we conduct hundreds of rescues across West and Central Africa with our planes and helicopters and our team of doctors. Now, our service runs much cheaper and much leaner than our Western counterparts. We've had to think outside the box a lot when it came to sourcing for medical equipment, when it came, for, when it came to keeping our operating costs low, and we operate primarily in Nigeria, so we have quite dangerous terrain sometimes to cover and to rescue people from. Now, I really believe that African entrepreneurs in the next few years can join the leagues of General Electric and Medtronic and Oxylog to deliver the next generation of healthcare solutions and not just be recipients of aid but owners of trade. I often hear development community executives say things like, okay, I'm gonna have to put on my American accent now, let me just chill, okay. We're not the kind of organization that just gives them fish. We teach them how to fish. <laughs> but my question to that is, what if I don't like fish? What if I want steak? The truth is that sugar daddy relationships like this one are unsustainable and rarely stand the test of time. But a relationship between equals has a fighting chance. Thank you. All right, between Louis Vuitton and steak, we know the kind of lady this one is. All right. Um, so next up, we have Jane Otai. 
um, someone who I have just profound respect for, the kind of work that she does. She's going to talk about it. Um, we were on a panel earlier, and you know, I just am continually uh, touched by the, the sort of direct service work that Jane does and how she always centers those people, which she's, of course, going to do again today for you. Um, she's a senior program advisor at JPEGO, which is um, related to Johns Hopkins. And her interesting fact is that she loves cooking but has a hard time following Western recipes because she can't find the ingredients in Kenya. So here she is, Jane. So I'm one person who hardly sleeps. I sleep very light. And I'll be able to tell you what keeps me awake. I work in Nairobi and in the urban slums of Nairobi. And in these communities, that's where about 60% of the population of Nairobi lives. And women and girls in these communities have very scant information about health generally and especially family planning. So these are the women that I interact with every week and every day. And I keep thinking about them even in my sleep. And many of them are illiterate women. So I really have to think how I can bring across the messages of health to them. In one of these meetings, I met Kadra. Kadra is a 26-year-old lady. But when you look at Kadra, you would think she's 40 because she's worn out. When you, her health is very poor. And when she sneaked into one of these young mother's clubs, she came slowly and got in with her little baby, who is actually four years old, but when you look at the boy, you could actually think he's two years due to malnutrition. So when Katra came in, it hit me that many women hear about health issues, family planning on radio and television, but they need to interact with other women in order to really have a first-hand information about how family planning works. And for this reason, we have young mothers clubs that have been set up by Japaigo, where we meet weekly with these women to talk about issues of health, issues of childcare, issues of family planning, issues of marital relationships. And we talk to them every week, and this message slowly comes down. But I found that there is a way that I can communicate with them, and these are my tools. I use sticks with these women. And in these meetings, we divide the women into like four groups. And some groups have seven children, others five, three, and two. And for those women who have many children, soon they run out of the sticks because they are not able to provide the food, the clothing, education for their children, and they soon realize that, oh, with many children, I can't, actually cannot provide everything. So we ask, what are the, some of the coping mechanisms if you're not able to provide for their education? What do you do? And these are real choices for these women. And many of them will say, you know, we give the younger children food, and the older children go without food. Or we take the boys to school, and the girls remain home because we cannot take all the children to school. And for those who have run out, they say, well, in my family, we were 10 children. And I decided to go into prostitution to be able to support our, our home. So finally, they realize that there is a relationship between family plan, between having many children and whether you can be able to provide for these children using these sticks. So I asked again, so what have we learned in the few weeks that we've been together? Then Kadra slowly puts up her hand and she says she wants to contribute. Say, okay, Kadra, tell us. Then Kadra says, you know, I have had 11 children in my life. I got married when I was 13 years old and over time I gave birth to many children and I continued giving birth because they were dying. Seven of them, seven, I have put in the ground. I have buried seven of my children. I only have four children remaining. And it's because I didn't know about family planning. Nobody told me about it. But over the weeks, I have learned about family planning. And actually, I have an implant. It's here. I have an implant. And it can protect me for five years. And I'm also telling other women about family planning now. 
So I realized that actually this program is making an impact on the women that we talk to, on the women. They are able now to relate family planning, child survival, and provision to their families and children. So that's the work that I do, and it keeps me awake every night. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. <clears throat> Amazing. It's so powerful to see Jane up on the opening stage yesterday. So our last speaker, our last fellow to present to you tonight is an amazing, amazing person named B.C. Alimi. He is the founder of a consultancy in his name, B.C. Alimi Consultancy. He submitted to us that he loves Apple products. All right. I think there's actually much more to this amazingly courageous person, and you're about to meet him right now. BC. When I was growing up, I wanted to be either a lawyer or an actor. So in 1999, when I got admission into the University of Lagos to study theater arts, it was a dream come true. Three months into my admission, I met Ibrahim. Ibrahim was everything I wanted to be. He was tall, handsome, intelligent, witty, with a very wicked sense of humor. I remember he once made me part with my feeding allowance because I dared him. Such was the relationship between Ibrahim and I that he has such an impactive influence on my life. So it was. After my first year holiday, and when I resumed back to school, I got a call. Ibrahim would like to see me. He's in the hospital. I rushed to see him. And the moment I walked into the ward, I saw my best friend. He was lying there on the bed. I could see his ribs through his skin. There was cancer all over his skin. His skin was dark. His eyes was big and was popping out of his skulls. He was lying down there. His hands were withered. His skin wrinkled. I couldn't help myself. I broke down. And then, he turned around and he looked at me and he said, come over here, bitch. <laughs> Even at this particular time, he still had a sense of humor. I walked up to him, he stretched out his very weak hands and he held me and he said, I've got AIDS. And the doctor said, I've only got a few days to live and I would like to talk to you. And he looked right into my eyes and through me, and he said, BC, of all my friends, you are the only one that can get the message across to every of our friends about HIV, and I want you to promise me that you will do this. I was young. I had no idea what he wanted me to do, in my frustration, I started looking for an answer. Then I came across an organization in Nigeria called Alliance Right, was working with gay men at that time in the area of HIV. I started to volunteer for them. And a few months into volunteering, I was given the opportunity to become the program director. That came with the responsibility of lobbying the Nigerian government to start an HIV framework that we include men who have sex with men, sex workers, and drug users. This was a big challenge for me. In Nigeria, a country where public health is defined by religion, it was hard. Every day I tried, I hit my head against the wall. Then in 2004, I was invited to the fourth National AIDS Conference in Abuja to give a talk alongside representative from sex workers and drug users. And then, 
I told the story of Ibrahim. Just then, the health minister stood up and he looked at the three of us and he said, it's time for you to join us in the fight against HIV. It was very much like I was dreaming. I wasn't expecting it in Nigeria for this to happen. Few weeks later, I got an email from him actually inviting us to be part of the drafting committee. And that, for the first time, changed the HIV policy framework in Nigeria. However, 10 years later, in 2014, President Goodluck Jonathan signed a bill into law that prescribed 14 years imprisonment for known or perceived homosexuals in Nigeria. The law also prescribed 10 years imprisonment for anybody that provides services for known or perceived homosexuals. That means that HIV prevention work in Nigeria had to stop. It's not just that. That 17% of HIV positive gay men living in Nigeria will not have access to treatment. In my frustration, the picture of Ibrahim came back to me. And then I realized that no matter what happens, I have to keep his memories alive because there's still so much work to be done so that there will never be another Ibrahim. Thank you. Thanks, BC. Uh, my name is Andrew Quinn. I direct the New Voices Fellowship at the Aspen Institute. And as you can tell, it's my joy and my honor to work with these people. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> um, we want to thank tonight, obviously, our friends and sponsors at the Gates Foundation. Many thanks to Barbara Bush, who is an ally in what we're trying to do, and John and Courtney, who have helped us right along the way helping with telling stories, helping to think through how to get some of these messages across. Uh, we're gonna be opening nominations for our next class in the 1st of September. So if you know anybody, if you have any thoughts, check our website, aspennewvoices.org. And um, please, the fellows are here, and I'm sure they'd love to talk to you. Thanks. <laughs>